this certainly is a very, very strange story, is it not? It really is. But it's a beautiful example of all those things that I'm talking about when we're talking about characteristics or traits of Southern humor. Um, you've read the story, so we don't have to go hash through it. And it's a pretty obvious story, too. I mean, unless you just were brain dead, you didn't, you know, or were sleeping at the time, uh, hopefully you caught on to what all was going on. A few background things that I think are very important. Um, Flannery O'Connor, who sadly didn't live very long, was a tremendous writer, a wonderful writer, a terrific body of work that she left, even though she didn't live very long. She died, I believe, in 1964 uh, from uh, complications due to lupus and uh, went to went to the University of Iowa's MFA program, the finest probably the finest um, uh, fine arts program for writers in the United States. Uh, staunch believer in the civil rights movement, uh, and uh, that was not something that was very safe for anyone, uh, but even for a, uh, a white person in the rural South to be so outspoken in, in support of uh, civil rights throughout the 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, uh, there were many white people who got killed if they stood up for uh, for what they believed was the right thing when it came to a position on civil rights and uh, voting rights and equal access and desegregation. So um, uh, quite a courageous position for her uh, living in what we essentially north central Georgia or central Georgia. Milledgeville is the town that she was from. Um, a lot of what she believed and a lot, and you see this in her fiction, was informed by her Catholic religious views. She was a big follower of the theologian Teilhard de Chardin and um, and his writings and uh, it it really is very prominent the more you read chardin uh, the more you read uh, uh, the more you realize uh, how much she really uh, followed what he what he taught in terms of moral and religious thought um, it, she's very big on a comedy of humors type of thing. If you look at some of the Renaissance and 18th century drama, for example, where characters, especially uh, comedies, um, uh, characters have names that indicate some sort of uh, characteristic or trait of their personalities. You see this especially also in Dickens in the 19th century, where people's names somehow indicate their, their, uh, their personalities. Mrs. Hopewell right? Mrs. Hopewell. Uh, and then you have Holga, okay? Now, uh, you know, these are not just names picked out of nowhere, right? Uh, these are names that are that are designed to, to sort of evoke some sort of response from you or some some sort of evaluation of their character to reveal something about their character. So, so yeah, you always have to kind of look at that and, and, uh, and that's your first sort of tip off. The thing I really want to cover here is how uh, this particular story is very much like several others that she wrote um, and uh, they, they've been anthologized. It's a, there's a wonderful anthology of her works out there that you really should pick up if you like uh, O'Connor. Um, where you have a pattern in the story frequently. Um, it starts off with a flawed or injured character who exhibits no moral growth. And in this case, we have Holga, who is is flawed. Now, I'm not talking about just physically, but uh, on a moral or personal level, she's flawed. She is injured. That's not her fault. Um, it, it's not something that is she is to be blamed for or judged negatively about, but she has, I think it's very clear in the story, she has allowed the injury she suffered to stunt her moral and spiritual growth. She's allowed that to happen. Bitterness has turned to turned her sort of to pursue education as opposed to interpersonal relationships. That greater and greater level of education simply reminded her of how much different she is from her family. She begins to look down on her family. She considers them to be terribly ignorant people, um, that she's so much more enlightened than they are. They're such backwards, you know, redneck hicks, and she's just embarrassed by them um, because she, of course, has this wonderful formal education. She has a PhD in philosophy, uh, which has, by the way, done her absolutely no good because she studied philosophy, and she 
has exhibited no moral or philosophical or spiritual growth as a result of it. She studied it as an abstract academic subject. She hasn't really applied anything. She hasn't become a better person. She's just acquired degrees. And the degrees have fed her sense of superiority, which has created even more distance between herself and the people she should love and care most about, and that's her family. You say, well, well, but her family is embarrassing to her. They're, they're, they're a bunch of hicks. And, and Well, welcome to the club. We all have family members that we're not very proud of. You have to love them anyway. You have to have dinner at Thanksgiving with them anyway. right? You'll see this in Walker's story as well. You know, w w What do we do when um, you come from sort of a lower working class rural family and uh, you go off to the big university and you get your big degree, your highfalutin degree, and now what do you do? Yeah, you're different. You are different. You have an education, and many of your family may not, but you still have to love them, and you still have to find a way to connect and relate. And, 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 and so, so Holga has a, she insists on going by Holga. She does that on purpose. So she's a real piece of work psychologically. She is stunted. She is frozen you know, suspended animation morally. She then has to have, like so many other characters in, in O'Connor's work, she has to have some sort of violent encounter almost. In this case, it's not terribly violent, but in some cases, it actually is physical violence um, that shakes her out of her zone, that, that, that jolts her, that almost slaps her metaphorically. Um, and in this case, the Bible salesman turns out to be a phony, uh, it, it it's really sad, I know, and it's really heartbreaking, and it's just, you feel terrible for her because she thinks she's actually going to make some sort of love connection with him up there in the loft. She thinks, here's a man who is attracted to her and enamored of her, and she sort of wraps that all up in her sense of superiority. She's going to be the one that... that you know, they're going to fall in love and she's going to bring him out of his unenlightened state and she's going to be the one that, that, that helps him advance intellectually. Um, and he'll have none of the sort. He's a con man. He'll tell you he's a con man and he doesn't care. Um, and when he opens the suitcase and when you see his trophies, which are, oh yes, very creepy and slimy and weird, um... And when we find out, most importantly, that he didn't bring her up there in the loft in order f to have sex with her. Okay, we're all adults here. We know that's what's going on here. Oh no, that's not what he wants. She thinks that's what he wants. And she's sort of seriously considering it. But when she finds out that what he wants, what he wants is actually something even more intimate than sexual relations. He doesn't want sex. No. He wants to see her leg. And that, to her, is the most intimate thing that she could do with another person. Not sex. Sex would be much, much less intimate than showing this one thing that she's, you know, hidden from everyone, that, she's, that always sets her apart, that makes her different, that, 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 is the thing that she's most self-conscious about. And, and he runs off with it. He runs off with it. And she's left there to ponder the moral implications of this encounter. But his great line, I've been believing in nothing all my life. In other words, to paraphrase, you didn't need to go to school to be an atheist. You wasted years of your life. You wasted eight years of your life in college. For what? You didn't grow up to be any more spiritually enlightened than a guy like me who didn't bother with school. He just became a crook and a scumbag and someone who takes advantage of other people. So, you're no better than I am. And yet you wasted all this time trying to better yourself. But did you really? You know, will academic degrees make you a better person? Clearly not. It, don't, it, won't even, it actually won't even make you smarter because I fooled you, lady. So, so that's that pattern there of a flawed or injured character. Sometimes it's not, you feel sympathy actually for them, but they need to be jolted out of their sort of rut. And sometimes this is a sort of a violent, traumatic, emotionally or even physically 
uh, encounter that they have, and then they have to consider what the aftermath is. It's quite an interesting pattern. I really encourage you to read more O'Connor if you get a chance. Very, very good writer. Um, kind of sad that she passed away so soon. But uh, uh, by the way, in Milledgeville, one of the things that she had there in her home, she loved peacocks. And they have her home preserved there in Milledgeville. If you ever go through Milledgeville, Georgia, you got to go out of your way to find it. But it's there, and the home is there, and it's open to the public, and you can go and see. And they still have some of the peacocks that are descended from the original peacocks that she had there on the on the on the farm there. So it's kind of a cute thing to go out and do. And and um, because she loved peacocks so much, you'll often see peacock feathers and peacock um, things associated with her whenever you see artwork and such. So now you know.